Hey, Michael, it's Wade. First, I want to thank you for... Obviously, you changed my life uh, with dance. You introduced me to dance and, and, to, and to music, really. Um, and just congratulate you on, on, on changing the world of, of, of music and, and, and music videos and just pop culture for all time. And um, you should be proud. Congrats. There have been many disgusting statements made recently concerning allegations of improper conduct on my part. These statements about me are totally false. As I have maintained from the very beginning, I am hoping for a speedy end to this horrifying, horrifying experience to which I have been subjected. I ask all of you to wait and hear the truth before you label or condemn me. Don't treat me like a criminal, because I am innocent. I have been forced to submit to a dehumanizing and humiliating examination by the Santa Barbara County Sheriff Department and the Los Angeles Police Department earlier this week. They served a search warrant on me which allowed them to view and photograph my body including my penis, my buttocks, my lower torso, thighs, and any other error that they wanted. They were supposedly looking for any discoloration, spotting, blotches, or other evidence of a skin color disorder called vitiligo, which I have previously spoken about. It was a nightmare, a horrifying nightmare, but if this is what I have to endure to prove my innocence, my complete innocence, so be it. I am not guilty of these allegations, but if I am guilty of anything, it is of giving all that I have, all that I have to give to help children all over the world. In 1993, Michael Jackson faced allegations of child molestation made by Evan Chandler, father of Jory Chandler. But he was defended by numerous other children who said they were never molested. One of the other children was Wade Robson. He's a very, very nice, kind person. He wouldn't hurt anybody. He doesn't have a mean bone in his body. He can do anything. Nothing? No. Kissing, hugging. He's hugged me, but that's his friendly hug. Yeah, you know, there's been different times where it'll just be me and Michael. Then there'll be other times where he has other friends over, too. That's what, like what Brett said, it's just a slumber party. We just have a lot of fun. I'm just telling the truth, and that's it. I love Michael very dearly. He's the best role model, best friend I've ever had. It's a huge bed. He sleeps on one side, I sleep on the other. How did you feel when you heard uh, that a boy was alleging that uh, Michael had abused him? I was shocked too, and I think it's sick, because I know Michael well enough that he wouldn't do anything like that. I know that for a fact. Michael was defended by not only Wade, but also by his mother and his older sister. And you know, I've slept in the same bed as Michael. It's just you watch cartoons, you fall asleep. You know, it's just a friendship. And I know he would never do anything to hurt my brother. He's just, he's the nicest guy you've ever met. People always are saying stuff about Michael, and it's just a, another allegation that he has to put up with. Knowing what sort of a childhood Michael had, he would never cause any distress to a, to a child. You don't have a problem with that? I have never had a problem with that. I trust Michael implicitly. I see how he is with my children. I've been there when uh, the abuse kids have been in Michael's room. I've been there with them. It's just party time. They watch videos, they eat junk food, they play video games. They play so hard. They fall asleep. They're exhausted. They fall asleep. From your standpoint, does it seem unusual for a 34-year-old man to have kids sleeping over? Not when you know Michael's background. Under normal circumstances, possibly yes. But Michael, Everybody knows he didn't have a childhood. He impresses on me constantly that it's very important that Wade does have a childhood because he's in the same industry. You just develop that, that trust with him immediately. He's just a very special person. Well, Michael's like family to us. Brad Barnes had the exact same friendship with Michael and spent just as much or maybe even more time with him than Wade. He is very nice, very, very nice and he cares a lot about kids, and he, he's very kind. What, what do you get out of your friendship with him? I, I, 
the companionship? Is he is he is he there for you to talk to and that kind of thing? Well, yeah, there for me to play with. Um, there for me to love. So he's like he's like a best friend, except he's big. He's just like a close friend, like a family friend. It's like I've known him all my life and in a past life. He doesn't act overly emotional in that kind of way. He, he, he like loves you like he's your own father, brother, or sister, mother. Have you slept in the same bed with him? Yeah, but I was on one side, he was on the other. And it's a, this big bed. Something bad about a child that, that made me feel really mad. In 1995, the Robsons were interviewed for Variety Today, and they were all adamant Michael was innocent. In fact, they were so upset they felt they had to speak up, and that it was Wade's decision to do so. Over the years, Wade told the story about how he started dancing and met Michael when he was just five years old many times and always with the same enthusiasm and passion and always acknowledging how great it was to have Michael in his life. Um, when did the dream start for you with your, with your dancing? Uh, pretty much when I was two, as soon as I could walk, I saw the making a thriller, Michael Jackson's making a thriller, and uh, I think it was my brother's tape, I saw it when I was two, and, and uh, as soon as I figured out how to use my legs, you know, started uh, learning all the dance moves, and we just watched that all day, every day, and run into, the, run into the kitchen and hide every time the werewolf part came on. As I said, I was born in Brisbane, Australia, and I was, and I was there until I was uh, eight. But when I was five years old, Michael was um, touring the world. Uh, it was the Bad Tour in 87. And his company was holding these um, dance competitions for people to impersonate him in, in, in different countries that he went to. The way it went down was all my mom's friends were saying, you know, he's really good, you should put him in it. I had like a full custom, you know, bad outfit made, right, with the buckles and the red yeah. stripe and the full deal. And, but it was also like my mom's belt wrapped around me like four times, oh, 80 cute. studded belt, you know. <laughs> so she called him and, and um, I was actually too young, it was like eight and up or something like that. They said, well let him do it for fun, he's, you know, he's not going to win, but we'll let him do it. And I, uh, I went in with my full bad suit and hat and everything and, and uh, I ended up winning it. And then I went on the finals and won that and the prize was to meet Michael. And there was like a meet and greet after that and same thing, had my outfit rocking again, mm -hmm. the bad outfit. You know, there was tons of people around. Um, but he was sort of tripping out on my outfit and, and asked me if I danced. And I said, yeah. And he said, do you want to perform with me in the show tomorrow night? And he said, do you want to perform with me tomorrow night in the show? And I said, okay. And he was like, you know, do you dance? Yeah. I said, yeah. So he said, uh, why don't you perform with me tomorrow night in the show? And, okay. He throws me up on stage with Michael and, and uh, I run to the front of the stage. <laughs> Saw Michael throw off his hat. So I threw mine off in the audience <laughs> and just started killing it and I was just like, oh, you know, this is it, this is what I want to do. The end of the show, the last song was bad and it was him and Stevie Wonder on stage. Michael comes up to me and sort of like gives me this face and kind of does some little move and I take it as get into it more. And then I remember at one point Michael came up to me and you know, sort of like gave me one of these sort of things. And I took it as, you know, get into it, like let's go a little mm -hmm. deeper. Turns out that what he meant was, come on, let's go. Like, it's over. <laughs> the kids are taking off, and I'm just gone to the world, right? Downstage center, you know how it is. So that was like the first time I ever experienced that, obviously at that level. So they were, they, you know, two guys come on and take Stevie Wonder off stage. They take all the other kids off stage. Michael's just in the, uh, you know, the back of the stage dying laughing. And the show's over, and the, and the band is just jamming, and it's just me and the band. And the band's just jamming, and it's just this little five-year-old out front, and I just wouldn't stop dancing. And I finally realized that everybody was gone and, and ran off, you know? Uh, he, he, he wanted to talk to me and my mom again the next, the next day, so we ended up coming back to his hotel and hanging out with him for a little bit, my mom and I. And, and that was kind of the first time we'd ever talked. Yeah, and that was it. So that was my first kind of entrance into the business, and I went and joined a, a dance company the next day. Because Michael actually meant, because we met with Michael after that concert, went up to his, with my mother and everything, went up to his hotel and talked for a couple of hours, and he made my mother promise him then that, uh, that she wouldn't put me through formal training as a dancer. And because I just had natural talent, he wanted to just kind of flourish as this just sort of raw energy, you know? So after the show, he told your mom not to, he, he made her promise not to 
let you take formal training, right? Yeah. Do you think that that had a huge effect on how you dance now? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, yeah, of course. I'm sure my movement would be very different. It would be maybe Wade Robson, the prima ballerina. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? In another lifetime. We'll yeah. To see that. And then when I was seven, the company came out to America to perform at Disneyland. And um, we hadn't kept in contact with Michael, but we figured we wanted to try and meet him again. Which is not something you just do. You don't just say, hey, talking about Michael Jackson. Michael again, yeah. yeah. Got a hold of a secretary. She talked to him and he remembered me from when I was five and wanted to meet me again. So we went to the studio where he was recording the Dangerous album at the time, and it was like 89. Then he asked the whole family to come back to the ranch, his place, that night, Neverland. And uh, we ended up staying there for like a week. Um, that must be every kid's dream. I mean, my dream would have been to go there too. Yeah, I mean, you show, it's Disneyland. You know, his house we showed up, it was just the best thing in the world. We moved to America with my mother and sister when I was nine. And we ended up meeting Michael again, somehow, and uh, became friends. And he's stayed a, you know, a mentor and friend of mine since then. So then over the next two years, um, we stayed in contact with him. And we would, my mother and I would come out and visit every now and then for like six weeks at a time, hang out. I was about to turn nine, my mother, my sister, and I uh, packed up six suitcases one day and left. Michael sort of helped us out, sponsored us out to America. Michael helped me out in the beginning, put me in a couple of his videos, um, and they helped me get like a dance agent and that sort of thing. And so I would started dancing in other people's videos, and I then got a theatrical agent, started doing commercials and did like guest episodes in Full House and shows like that. And, and um, when I was, I think, 11, I got in a rap group. A rap duo, me and this other kid, and we ended up being signed to Sony Records and uh, did an album there. And that's what sort of got me interested in, in music production. What up, man? What's going on? Y'all got the cash? For you got what we came for? Fifteen each. Alright, man. Come on, man. So there. Oh, yo, you got the mad tofu money, yo. We need to get <laughs> something like that. You're right, shorty. Check out the Tim's, yo. Here you go, man. Straight out of Green Bay. Cool. Ooh. Gotta get back to school. All right, man. What? And to receive my consciousness, that is the cause of fun. And like the mother now said, it's that time. So find the feet and then if you're going sit back, relax with clown. Well, I started when I was two, actually. Like the first thing, yeah. Well, the first thing I ever saw was a making a thriller. Michael Jackson, remember that? Yeah. 
and it was like my brother's copy and I saw it when I was two years old and I was just hooked. By the time I was three, I had learned the whole routine. Basically, it seems like a walk, that's what I was doing. I was out there doing my little Michael moves. You know? <laughs> but um, yeah, and I started dancing professionally when I was like five. <laughs> well, what is it like? You just got it's got it never stops. It okay. keeps floating instead of hitting the position. You okay. know what I mean? As far as Brittany goes, we only worked for about two hours last night. You know, normally we rehearse three to four days at least for a commercial, and we had two hours. And in that two hours, learned the soccer stuff, and you know, on top of that, just choreography as well. And you started as a youngster dancing with Michael Jackson? Yeah, started dancing when I was like two, and then uh, won a dance competition when I was five that Michael was holding sort of all over the world doing his tour. And uh, it was like a dance alike contest like him. Right. I won that, and then the prize and was to And you moved into the ramp. Easy, easy Dean. No, no he's not moving into the ramp. No. Are you still friendly with Michael? Yeah, we still talk every couple months, catch up. You, you do, know? really? Yeah. Well, what's he like? What's he like? He's a good guy. He's a good guy? Yeah. Show me where he touched you. <laughs> Nothing ever like that. No, no, no nonsense, no shenanigans. No, but he's no, a no. weird guy, you have to admit. Right? You know what? At the end of the day, it's like everybody's got something weird about him. Everybody's got something strange about him. Yeah, but some people more than yeah, others. But yeah. True. At the end of the day, all I'm here, it's like, you know, you may not like him. You it's may have weird about thoughts the dancing about him. At the end of the day. Why don't you let me talk for a minute? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. But it's like, you know, mm -hmm. as long as people don't forget. You know how talented he is and what he's done for the music industry. Think whatever you want about him, but you can't deny his talent. Yeah. Wade had a successful career over the years. In 2003, he had his own show on MTV called The Wade Robson Project. In 2004, he played himself in the dance movie Got Served. Oh man! Live from Los Angeles, California! Give it up for Wade Robson! From 2006 till 2010, he was the choreographer for So You Think You Can Dance, for which he was awarded with two Primetime Emmy Awards. The idea is there's this bar, cafe, mm -hmm. 1930s type thing, it's smoky, it's sexy, mm -hmm. and on this particular night, the four 
slickest gangs in the city have showed up, and a turf war sort of ensues from there. A little blood's gonna be spilled on the dance floor. Ah. So as long as they can take a combination of their excitement with their focus, they'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> In 2005, Wade testified for the defense in Michael's trial. Wade and Brad Barnes both came to defend Michael, saying they never experienced any wrongdoing on Michael's part. The defense at Michael Jackson's trial began with two young men who testified that he never abused them. The first witness for Michael Jackson's defense, star choreographer Wade Robson, told jurors he first met Jackson at age five and shared a bed with him more than 20 times until he was 14. Two former Neverland employees told prosecutors Jackson groped Robson and took a shower with him. Robson, who once had a show on MTV, denied either of those things happened. Lead defense attorney Tom Mesereau asked, did Michael Jackson molest you at any time? Robson responded, absolutely not. The second defense witness, Brett Barnes, said the same thing, adding, I can tell you that if he had, I wouldn't be here. Barnes said he shared Jackson's bed until he was 19. And something strange happened in court. Prosecutors who'd called Robson and Barnes victims of sex crimes attacked them with sharp, very personal questions. Jurors seemed riveted as Robson was forced to describe photos of naked boys and read a series of graphic porn titles seized from Jackson's home. That treatment may be a signal to other Jackson friends who might testify. You know, Macaulay Culkin has been waffling back and forth on deciding whether to testify for a number of weeks now. And I would think that after he hears about uh, Wade Robeson's experience with the prosecutors, he might actually think twice about it. It was, it was that ugly. Robson seemed angry as he left court. His mother and sister will likely testify today. Nothing happened between me and Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson never uh, touched me inappropriately. If you, Jeffrey Figer, were named as a person for 12 years who, when you were a boy, were molested by somebody, wouldn't you want at some point to correct the record? Now, Brett Barnes was asked that question today, why are you here? He says, look, I'm very mad about it. I'm reading my notes here. They're putting my name in the dirt, and it's not true. I'm really, really, really not happy about it. His explanation for it. I know yeah. I'd want to know that. And if in a criminal trial I were named as one of the victims, and, and I wasn't a victim. In 2006, Wade is the choreographer for the animation movie Happy Feet, along with his sister Chantal. And in 2011, he's asked to work on the soundtrack for Happy Feet 2. He chooses a Janet Jackson and a Michael Jackson song to work with. Celebration, something that's about unity and just and introducing all of these characters again, introducing new characters amongst this massive celebration of dance and music. So I thought of Rhythm Nation. Um, George really connected to that, and then that's, once we found that song, then that really set us off on the path. I got in the studio with John Powell, the composer, and um, I got to co-produce uh, the song with him. And just, you know, hours after hours of just barreling through music and trying all of these different options, and, and we started, you know, getting to a place of, of a, a bass song mashup that we all started to feel really good about. Wade met his wife Amanda during the So You Think You Can Dance shows and she had a profound influence on him and his career. She inspired him to take a step back and start working on the film directing career he always wanted. They started making short films. One of them was shot at Neverland in 2007 with permission of Michael since there was a strict no camera policy and they thanked him in the credits. Well, 
only been in Neverland a couple of times, and I've talked to him a couple of times there, and he's created an amazing world there. Do you think he, what's the most misunderstood thing about Michael Jackson? Do you think that you know him? Um, Probably a number of things. That, I don't know, that anybody that lives that life is not going to be your average dude. <laughs> you know what I mean? In the simple ways, I mean. Yeah. You know, you live that there's you live that kind of life and that sort of fame from five years old. You're not going to go about your every day like everybody else because you've never lived a life like everybody else. So how would you know how to do that? Exactly. So and I think people take those simple things and turn them into something, you know, ten times, a hundred times more strange than they are. One of the things I noticed about you, and, I, and this goes back to why I said you were a stand-up guy, um, we covered the trial, and you were one of the few people to stick up for him. Mm -hmm. and, and why do you think that was, and why was it important for you to stick up for him? Because he's always been a friend to me. That's what you do for friends, you tell the truth. You know? How much did it hurt him, do you think, that people thought that because little boys were over, they would sleep in the bed, and they would take that as being something untoward? What happened to these little boys? How much did, it, did you think it really took it took out of him? Uh, yeah, I can't speak for him, but it would be an absolutely painful thing for anybody to go through. In October of 2008, Wade is asked to be the choreographer for Britney Spears' circus tour, but only two months later, he's out. According to Wade, he wants to focus on making movies. Is it true that you're going to choreograph for Britney's tour for next year? Yeah, I'm directing. It. Okay. Um, uh, my wife and I are co-writing it and uh -huh. designing it. I'm directing, uh, and I'll, I'll choreograph probably a third of it, and I'll hire other choreographers uh -huh. uh, for different sections. Okay. Um, but yeah, we're, so, uh, we're in the midst of that. When Michael suddenly dies in 2009, Wade is devastated, according to his sister Chantal. Wade writes a beautiful tribute to Michael called My Mentor, and it's included in the so-called opus, the definite book about his life. The official Michael Jackson opus was published in December of 2009. KET, I'm Wade Robson. You're getting a sneak preview of our West Side Story inspired VMA promo spot. There's so many connections with West Side Story and with Michael Jackson. I mean, Michael Jackson, one of his biggest inspirations was West Side Story. Um, if you look at the Beat It video, you look at the Bad video, uh, you look at the way you make me feel, there's so much that, he, that, he, that inspired him for those pieces. And then there's obviously such a huge connection between Michael Jackson and MTV and really starting this real music video generation on MTV I and mean, Michael was really the king of that. So I like all of those connections and obviously my connection with Michael and all of that coming together is kind of just one of those serendipitous things where all the elements have, have come together. So I'm excited for a lot of reasons to be a part of it. In general with Michael, um, just had a wonderful relationship. I learned so much from him as an artist and as a kind human being. Um, and it's my goal to try and just continue uh, as much as I can in my own little world, that legacy. Uh, I'm not sure about being a part of the tribute. I I've heard about it and I'm excited about it either way, whether I'm involved in it or not. Um, it's as I, you know, because of Michael's connection to MTV, to all that he's done for the world of dance, uh, and pop music and pop dance, you know. There's no way that you couldn't pay tribute to that in the, pace, in the place that it began, MTV. We talk so much about him as the pop legend, which is important, but it's nice to really remember that he was a man, that he was a father, and that's what it's really about, is a father and his children, and he was a wonderful dad, and um, you know, at least they had the time with him that they did. Janet Jackson asks him to be a part of a tribute for Michael, where she will recreate the music video screen. Wade is one of the choreographers who were asked to participate. He works close with Janet to make this a special event. Because everyone's a major choreographer, you, you maybe think that there are egos that will come into the room. And that's all left at the door. It was so nice. I'm going to introduce everybody. They're all amazing and talented choreographers. Our top, Laurie Ann Gibson. Hi, Nina. Yeah. Hi, 
Robson. <laughs> Lovely way, Robson. <laughs> It's like you're seeing all these carbon copies of your brother. It was very emotional for me. And I was trying not to cry. And I got choked up a few times. It was, it gave me goosebumps. It, I thought they looked incredible. Right, let's go work now. Come on. <laughs> it's trippy how it kind of keeps professional. Like, you know, Michael inspired all of us. You know, maybe we inspired some of them, and then Michael obviously inspired all of them, and now they inspired us again. And it just right? keeps going back and yeah. forth. You know. Now we want to go back in and step up to their level. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do this. Oh my gosh, I can't do this right now, but. Yeah. These are uh, Michael's gloves from the bad music video. I mean, Michael gave them to me when I was, I don't know, seven or eight. He's going to be with us spiritually, but I wanted to feel something physical from him. So um, I'm probably going to rock one of these tonight too while we perform on stage and just feel that much closer to him. When he's asked to direct and choreograph the movie Step Up 4 in 2010, he accepts the job, since he's still ambitious in being a film director one day. Apparently this was something Michael had encouraged him to do, telling him he could be as big as Steven Spielberg. But in March of 2011, he once again pulls out. And soon after, he says in an interview, he's starting on Michael Jackson's Cirque du Soleil show, called One. Hi, it's David, um, and I'm with Rhythmatic TV, and we're here at New York City Pulse Summer Intensive 2011 with Mr. Wade Robson. In regards to your professional life, we know you've danced with everybody and anybody choreograph for everybody and anybody what are you doing now besides raising your child that you now have yeah things have changed since then raising a boy um, but uh, I'm starting on uh, Cirque du Soleil Michael Jackson show um, so it's you know the equivalent of uh, the Beatles love show that they have or the Elvis show but for Michael um, which is uh, you know, exciting and terrifying all at the same time because it's such a huge uh, responsibility. Uh, but that was why I took it on. You know, Michael was such a huge part of my career and life. We were friends for 20 years before he passed, since I was seven. Um, so it's an opportunity for me to give back a little bit to, to, to his legacy. It's such a big part of his legacy and to, to make sure as much as I can that it's done right and that it really represents uh, his essence. So that's kind of a really big undertaking. In 2011, he also starts doing a series of dance workshops for The Pulse. And he's part of a film series called The Move, where several famous choreographers talk about dance. Eventually, the plan is to make a longer movie. For me, it started really young. Um, the first thing I ever saw was Michael Jackson's Thriller. I saw it when I was two and just flipped out on it and loved it and wanted to watch it every day. Yeah, and that was the education that I indirectly got from Michael Jackson as far as a cautionary tale, you know, um, which I think I was lucky to have too. I mean, he, I didn't realize it then, you know, when I was younger, like it was Michael Jackson and, you know, all of his accomplishments and legend and famous and I gotta be that, I gotta work as hard as he is, I gotta be that legendary and um, but then getting older and looking back you know on him you know in a more reflective nature realizing like thank God I got to be around him in that way 
because I realize that it's not, I don't want to be like him as far as life, you know. He obviously had to work so hard, you know, to do the things that he did, that he has accomplished. Um, and, and if that's what you want to do with your life, right on. Me personally, I got to a point, you know, I think, you know, with us, and then I had that to look back on and going, you know, so many times with him when he was just, is that same thing. If the work ended, like he just had nothing, you know. Um, never trusted anybody, you know what I mean? And it's just kind of like, I don't want to live like that. I don't want to be that guy, you know. Um, so I think that was a, a blessing for me to have him in my life as a, you know, there was amazing things that I learned from him, role model things as far as education and that sort of thing. But then a lot of things I realized I didn't want to be, you know. What are your dance backgrounds? We both started somewhat similar way, dancing with, with Michael Jackson. Worked, choreographed and directed for artists such as uh, Demi Lovato, Britney Spears, and Sync, Pink, Maya, Usher, um, Nicki Minaj. Uh, Michael Jackson, Janet Jackson, um, Celine Dion, Donna Ross, uh, Jennifer Lopez, Brian McKnight. Wow, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> Wade gives an interview to Masterclass in July of 2012, where they talk to all kinds of instructors in various disciplines. I remember I had this moment uh, when we shot the finale of, of the Wade Robson project. You know, as you said, I had gained a certain amount of notoriety before the show. And then it, it just, it turned into a different thing um, after the Wade Robson project. What I realized had changed is a lot of the recognition was like for being the cool guy on MTV, <laughs> you know? At that point, I kind of stopped that train that was heading in that direction. Hmm. And, um, and just sort of stepping back and realize, you know, remembering where I really wanted to be, just sort of behind the scenes creating. Hmm. Did a lot of the people you were around also influence that, that decision? I mean, you saw, you saw Michael Jackson, the biggest star in the world from the time you were five years old to I mean, you had a relationship with him until his passing. You were yeah. around Britney and Justin Timberlake when they were the biggest stars in the world. So what did being exposed to their lifestyles and how fame affected them? How did that affect you? Yeah, particularly with, um, you know, growing up friends with Michael, um, you know, that, I mean, obviously that's a whole nother scale, but that level of fame and, um, you know, rightly so for all the amazing things and the amazing work that he did. But I saw, uh, how that tormented him as well. So, you know, when I was really young, uh, of course, idolized him and wanted to be anything and everything that he was and that sort of scale. Um, and then as I was getting a little older and going through that experience and then kind of referring back to the sort of stuff I saw with Michael's life um, and realizing, yeah, again, for me personally, I don't know that I want that particular version mm -hmm. of life. And it was interesting because at the same time that, that, that the MTV thing was happening and that was sort of skyrocketing, I met who is now my wife, Amanda. What? When I met her and you know she grew up Hawaii, surfing, soccer, family, nature, I was going, <gasps> you know, I, like I want yeah. some of that in my life. Yeah. You know, I really stepped back on a lot of things in the work realm and, and ever since I've con I'm continually trying to sort of really find that balance. Perspective shifting. The interesting thing that happened is after I kind of did that for a while, I felt reinvigorated. Then, just 10 months later, in May 2013. He sexually abused me from seven years old until 14. You're accusing someone who is deceased of criminal activity. He performed sexual acts on me and forced me to perform sexual acts on him.
Wade Robson was my first witness in Michael Jackson's criminal trial. I started with one of my strongest witnesses for Michael Jackson, Wade Robson. He was adamant that he had never been touched, never been molested, never been abused, directly or indirectly. I called his mother and sister as witnesses to corroborate what he said, because they traveled on these tours too. And to have him suddenly reverse course so radically, years after Michael Jackson has passed away and can't speak up for himself, is outrageous. Lead defense attorney Tom Mesero asked, did Michael Jackson molest you at any time? Robson responded, absolutely not. What happened? First of all, one thing I want to clear up is that this is not a case of repressed memory. It's anyway, just been reported in the yeah, press some. I never forgot one moment of what Michael did to me. During 2012, Wade keeps sending his mother emails with tons of questions about his encounters with Michael. Apparently, he had trouble remembering. One of the emails she sent back sounds a bit disturbing. He was an adult, he was intelligent, he was articulate, and he was adamant that nothing untoward had ever happened when he was with Michael Jackson. I was psychologically and emotionally completely unable and, and unwilling to understand that it was sexual abuse. Wade says he never understood it was sexual abuse, yet also claims Michael kept calling him during the 2005 trial, actually mentioning the alleged abuse to him. Macaulay Culkin said Michael actually avoided talking to him in the bathroom at the courthouse in 2005 when he testified on his behalf. Wade was also firmly questioned in court by Tom Mesereau and Ron Zonen, who both grilled him about the alleged abuse by Michael Jackson. His answers clearly show he understood what sex, abuse or pedophilia was. He said there had been no sexual molestation, no inadvertent touching, nothing improper by Michael Jackson. And then he withstood a very powerful cross-examination by a very seasoned prosecutor and Wade Robson never changed his position. He was adamant that nothing had happened. In fact, he called the allegations ridiculous. And I'm calling this recent development equally ridiculous. Wade claims he didn't understand or believe he had been abused, even though, according to him, Michael talks about it in these phone calls, and even though Wade was questioned about it in court. And then he also says he never forgot what Michael did to him. It's hard to believe Wade had no clue this was about sexual abuse. And ask yourself, if Michael had molested Wade, why would he want him to be the first witness to testify on his behalf? Wade could have then told everyone in front of the worldwide media that Michael did molest him and that he was guilty. But he didn't. He didn't do it in 1993. He didn't do it in 2005. He didn't do it in 2009 after Michael had died. He didn't do it in all those years in between. In every interview he ever had over the last 20 years. He only did it when he was rejected from the Michael Jackson tribute in 2011 after he begged for the job. After Michael died, multiple tributes were being held and Wade jumped on the opportunity to participate, which makes sense considering their relationship. He sent an email to Jean-Francois Bougeard of Cirque du Soleil, where he says he regrets pulling out of the tribute show because he was focused on the job he had directing the Step Up 4 movie. But then he pulled out of the directing job as well, since he found it hard to combine with being a new father. He repeats several times in the email 
how passionate he is about doing this MJ tribute. In his short therapy sessions in 2011, he said that he talked about MJ, but not about the abuse, even though he apparently never forgot what happened. Note the dates. Wade wrote this letter just five days after he started therapy on May 16, 2011. It turns out that Wade was not going to be a part of the one show, so now he lost both jobs. The Step Up for Directing job and the MJ Tribute Show won. Both extremely important to him when it came to Michael Jackson, who he lost not even two years before this moment. In fact, he sent Tosh Jackson that email to be invited for Michael's memorial on July 7, 2009. He wrote an amazing tribute to Michael for the Opus book. He did a moving tribute to Michael with Janet Jackson and he went to the premiere of the This Is It movie in October 2009. He kept on praising Michael in his interviews up until the middle of 2012. He was extremely disappointed not to be a part of the actual funeral for Michael on September 3rd, 2009. As we saw from the interviews in 2010, 11 and 12, nothing ever indicated something had changed for Wade when it came to Michael. The only thing he let on was that he felt a kind of empathy for Michael, having worked hard all his life and not having much of a personal life. Now remember, this is all going on while Wade, according to him, fully remembered he had been sexually abused. I didn't realize it then, you know, when I was younger, like, it was Michael Jackson and, you know, all of his accomplishments and legend and famous and I gotta be that, and I gotta work as hard as he is, I gotta be that legendary and um, but then getting older and looking back you know on him you know, in a more reflective nature realizing like thank God I got to be around him in that way because I realized that that's not I don't want to be like him as far as life you know he obviously had to work so hard, you know, to do the things that he did, that he has accomplished. You know, so many times with him when he was just, there's that same thing. If the work ended, like he just had nothing, you know. Um, never trusted anybody, you know what I mean? And it's just kind of like, I don't want to live like that. I don't want to be that guy. You know, growing up friends with Michael, um, you know, that, I mean, obviously that's a whole nother scale, but that level of fame and, um, you know, rightly so for all the amazing things and the amazing work that he did. But I saw uh, how that tormented him as well. So, you know, when I was really young, uh, of course, I idolized him and wanted to be anything and everything that he was in that sort of scale. Um, and then as I was getting a little older and going through that experience and then kind of referring back to the sort of stuff I saw with Michael's life um, and realizing, yeah, again, for me personally, I don't know that I want that particular version of life. According to Wade, a lot of the abuse took place at Neverland, so to someone with those memories you would think it would be a house of horrors. But in 2005, during the trial, Wade asks Grace, Michael's nanny, if he and Amanda can get married at Neverland. And of course, at the time, Michael had other things to worry about. Two years later, in 2007, Wade and Amanda asked Michael's permission to shoot a short movie at Neverland, which he grants them. As we saw earlier, they thanked him in the credits and called Neverland a sacred place. Again, something that you don't expect a real victim would do. And again, this doesn't make any sense. So we just got here today, it's Saturday, February 3rd, 2007. We shoot tomorrow, sunrise. So, here we go. Morning, babe. Mm -hmm. Morning. How are you? Good. It's beautiful. How can this music feel as simple, as peaceful, and as organic as possible? I see the space. I hear yeah. The space. Oh, wow. Oh, oh. oh. How are things? How do you think the shoot's going so far? Why'd you ask yourself and then you want me to answer? So people can see that I'm asking you. Because <laughs> I'm the reporter. 
I think it's going well. We've got, look at what we've got. I mean, I'd have to be pretty bad to mess this up. It's all here oh, for there me. It is. In October 2008, he was asked to choreograph for Britney Spears' new tour, for which rehearsals would start in the beginning of 2009. Wade claims he pulled out, but according to Britney, he was let go. She says Wade was only hired to do the promotional tour. This was around the same time the news of Michael's This Is It tour was announced. It's going on tour, you know, in July. Really? So it's going to be London for three months, maybe more. And it's going to be a big uh, comeback. Some people claim Wade expected to be involved in the tour, but he wasn't asked or anything. Some people, like a former dancer who was in the show with Wade Robson, called MTV Shakedown. MTV has unearthed the hottest dancing talent as we scoured Europe for the best movers and shakers to compete in Shakedown with Wade Robson. Wade is one of the world's hottest choreographers and has worked with the likes of Britney Spears and Justin Timberlake. I'm looking for dancers with energy, power, focus, and most importantly, good rhythm. What's up, yeah? Only, only one group can stay, and one group has to go, okay? This group, you guys have to go home. So, the 15 staying at boot camp are Sergi, Becky, Chris. Sergi Rodriguez Martinez, who I contacted early 2019, after I saw his reaction on Facebook at Wade's interview in 2013, wrote the following. In 2004, I was dancing in the TV program of MTV Europe. Wade Robson was the director of this program. In a moment of conversations, we asked him what he thinks about all the news that says Michael abused children. He told us that he stayed a lot of times in Michael Jackson's house with other children to play, to sing, to dance, and never seen nothing that can be considered abuse. He explained to us he met the boy who accused Michael for the first time. Wade says, was not true. He told us that the parents of this boy wanted money and put big pressure to the boy to say that Michael abused him. Wade promised us that was not true, they only wanted money. Because Wade assured us that all the stories that people told about Michael aren't true. In December of 2010, he's being mentioned as the director and choreographer of Step Up 4, which to Wade was the culmination of his relationship with Michael, who predicted he would be a great movie director one day. But as we know, he pulled out because of personal reasons. This is the same time his son is born, in November of 2010. In 2011 and 2012, Wade is part of the Poles on Tour, working with old friend Chris Judd. They are doing a tour across the US dancing, as we saw earlier, to the music of artists such as Michael Jackson. Then, in May of 2012, he has another nervous breakdown. He claims he imagined his young son in the same alleged sexual relationship he was in with Michael, and that's when he realized it was abuse. But according to Wade, he never forgot what Michael did, and at the same time he claims he never realized it was about sexual abuse. So then you wouldn't realize someone did something to you either. And Wade didn't realize it was sexual abuse because that never happened. I never forgot one moment of what Michael did to me. But I was psychologically and emotionally completely unable and, and unwilling 
to understand that it was sexual abuse. The 2005 trial would most certainly have made it clear. When he was bombarded with stories, questions and references to the fact Michael was accused of sexually abusing a boy. So he indeed had always known what sexual abuse meant, and he had always known Michael did not do that to him. That is the only logical explanation. Despite this sudden realization in 2012, he doesn't go to the authorities or tells his mother or wife or his sister for that matter. Wade gives another interview talking about Michael as usual, and he starts researching his past with Michael by sending his mom tons of emails asking about what happened. But wait, didn't he say he always remembered what Michael did? This is Scott Ross. He was the private investigator for Tom Mesero in 2005. He's got something very interesting to say. One of the things that, that most people at this point don't know, but I will tell you, this is your exclusive. I have a relationship with Wade's older brother. Mm. When I met the family, one of the first things that Joy, his mom, said to me is, my son, my other son, is a private investigator. Oh, okay, interesting, I didn't know that. And she said, would you like to meet him? And I said, no, not yet, because I didn't want to create a problem for the trial. So I met Shane after the trial ended, probably about two, three months after the trial ended. And I can tell you now that was what, in 05? Mm -hmm. I, I talked to him a week and a half ago. I talked to him three weeks ago. I refer him work all the time. Wow. Um, we became very good friends. I know his wife. I know his kids. And I'll tell you something else that's incredibly disturbing. So if if I'm part of the team that enabled this guy to, to assault his brother and then get away with it in the world, why are you friends with me? Wow. You know, that, that makes no sense. The other problem is, I feel bad. The other problem is last August, Wade's sister had a problem. She had a legal problem, mm. a big mm. legal problem. Mm. They called me. So this is last August. They've already filmed the movie. They've already finished the movie. They've already said that Michael was assaulting their brother. And if I'm part of that team, and it's true, why, why are you calling me? <laughs> when this thing broke in, what was it, 2013? Uh, is that when the initial yeah, lawsuit or whatever? Yeah. I picked up the phone and I called Shane and I said, let's just say I said, what the hell? <laughs> right. It's not what I said, but whatever. He said, and again, I, I adore Shane. I don't want anyone getting the wrong idea. He said, he's my brother and I need to be supportive. I said, okay, I get it. Uh, unfortunately, I think we're gonna have to agree to disagree on this one. And he said, yes. And we never, ever, ever discussed it until the case was dismissed. But I told him in no uncertain terms, I said, if the attorneys contact me, you know I'm gonna be on the other side because I don't believe that your brother was able to get past me. I'm sorry, I think he's lying. And and we left it at that. And he said, yeah, he gets it. He understands it's like today. I'm sitting here telling you things that I'm sure he would not appreciate. I said, you did the movie? And he said, yeah. Well, you know, Shane was in Australia the entire time. Mm -hmm. Shane was never even here. He was never even with his brother. Shane is older. 10, 12 years older. Shane was a police officer in Brisbane. So your brother's a police officer. This is happening to you and you don't tell your brother? Exactly. Well, right. this is going on. Wade's brother Shane, older brother Shane, is a police officer in Brisbane, Australia. And I'm not talking about a parking meter. I'm talking about a guy with a gun that goes out and kicks in doors and handcuffs people and full on, full blown, L.A. County Sheriff, L.A.P.D., full cop. I'm okay. Full cop. So you're telling me. Now, in this mockumentary is what I call it. He claims, Wade Robson claims that Michael Jackson was molesting him since the age of, what, seven to like 14. Okay. He has a brother in Australia that is a full-blown police officer. And he doesn't tell his brother any of this. Correct. 
let's take a look again at the cross-examination Tom Mesereau did in 2005, asking Wade very specific questions about abuse. You're aware of the allegations in this case, are you not? Yes. And are you aware as you sit here today that there's been allegations that Mr. Jackson molested you? Yes. Mr. Robson, did Mr. Jackson ever molest you at any time? Absolutely not. Mr. Robson, did Mr. Jackson ever touch you in a sexual way? Never, no. Mr. Robson, has Mr. Jackson ever inappropriately touched any part of your body at any time? No. Wade has different versions of that first night he spent at Neverland. And his sister, who was there as well, has an even different version herself. In his 2012 book draft, he says he believes Michael started touching him the very first night and that they were alone. But in his 2013 complaint, he says his sister was there the first night and it was the second night the abuse started. In 2016, he says nothing happened and he doesn't really remember. And in 2005 at the trial, under oath, he said nothing happened, even joking about how that would have woken him up. And his sister was there the entire week. His sister Chantal, however, had her own version of events. She said at the trial nothing happened. She slept on a different floor and they all slept in their clothes, because it was not a planned sleepover. They fell asleep after gaming and watching cartoons. I've been there when uh, the, these kids have been in Michael's room. I've been there with them. It's just party time. They watch videos, they eat junk food, they play video games. They play so hard. They fall asleep. They're exhausted. They fall asleep. No, There's I'm... nothing more to it than that. You know, I've known Michael since I was 10. Mm -hmm. He's never done anything to me. He's never done anything to my brother. Then he asked the whole family to come back to the ranch, his place, that night, Neverland. And uh, we ended up staying there for like a week. Um, <laughs> that must be every kid's dream. I mean, my dream would have been to go there too. Yeah, I mean, you show, it's Disneyland. You know, his house we show up, it was just the best thing in the world. And there are much more inconsistencies. In 2005, Wade said he was never shown porn magazines by Michael and didn't even know he had them. But in his 2013 complaint, he claims Michael showed him adult magazines and gave him alcohol from day one. Chantal said in her phone conversation, Michael always told them not to drink or do drugs. The problem with what Robson said, we pulled the transcript of the 2005 molestation trial where Wade Robson was Michael Jackson's star witness. The prosecutor grilled Robson on cross-examination. Here are some of the things that the prosecutor asked. He said, Mr. Jackson would periodically kiss you. Robson, no. Periodically hug you. Yes. Touch you? And he wouldn't answer that. He said, hug me. Did he ever kiss your lips? No. On occasion you stayed in bed with Mr. Jackson. Would you ever cuddle in bed? No. Would you lie next to one another? No. Would you touch? No. So he asked specific questions. Robson said he never ever forgot the specifics, yet he kept answering no, which then raises the issue. Did Robson lie during the 2005 trial or is he lying now? It puts him in a very precarious position because he is now suing both the estate and he has filed a civil lawsuit trying to get money, although he says money is not the object. Do you know, Wade? Do you know, James? how many times he abused you? Well, it's countless. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, countless. I was with him alone for long periods of time, times over many years, and it was constant. So that is hundreds and hundreds of times? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
In 2014, James Safechuck would join Wade in his lawsuit against the Michael Jackson estate, suing them for billions of dollars. Later, it turned out, they both worked on the movie Happy Feet in 2006 as well. Wade as a choreographer, as I already showed you, James as a video editor animator for Avatar Labs. In the documentary Leaving Neverland, Wade claims Michael molested him hundreds of times. But in 2005, his mother testified how he and his family didn't even visit Neverland that often. So how is it even possible for Michael to have molested Wade that much? In the phone conversation she had with Michael's private investigator, Chantal Robson said they were all so close, Wade would have told them for sure. This is what I would think so too. A seven-year-old would have told his mother, especially knowing he went back to Australia between the age of seven and nine and was no longer under direct influence of Michael. Especially knowing now Wade's older brother was a police officer even if the abuse had been true, Wade's mother and sister would absolutely have noticed something wasn't right with Wade, because he would have most certainly shown different and noticeable behavior. They talk about these victims of these, you know, these, these child victims, and these child victims keep quiet and they don't tell anybody and they don't do this and they don't do that. Well, they also change the way they behave. These child victims also start behaving a little more skittish. They're a little more shy. They're a little more this, a little more, you know, but no family members reported that with either one of them. No family member said, oh yeah, when he turned seven, he started to change the way he would dress or think or, or act or this or that or whatever. Nobody ever said that. He didn't all of a sudden become quiet. He didn't all of a sudden jerk when somebody touched him. He didn't pull away when somebody touched him. You know, again, these are all signs that you see of somebody who has been a, a victim of sexual assault as a child. And and nobody said anything about that. It just, yep, it happened, therefore it happened. It happened, it happened. Have a nice day. People who experience abuse follow very predictable paths in what they do with what has happened to them. If you've been abused, your abuser mishandled power and control. And what they took away from you is power and control. When a child is sexually abused, he experiences severe and long-term psychological consequences because they end up feeling depressed, uh, suicidal, they experience sexual dysfunction. Some trouble sleeping, a sudden change in eating habits such as refusing to eat, loss or increase in appetite, and difficulty swallowing. Mood swings, rages, insecurity, clinginess, withdrawal, excessive crying, fear of new or unusual people and places are also signs of sexual uh, Some abuse. children just become invisible, try to blend in and hope that nobody notices them. Uh, some children cope by becoming troublemakers or becoming so violent. These behaviors, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, and all that also increases their likelihood of being re-victimized again in childhood, later in life, during teenage years, or even in adulthood. Toys, pets or other children, provoking conversations about sex, drawing things that are sexual, telling sexual stories, and using new words for their genitals that children, you're not sure how they learn. when learned. sexual abuse is taking place, are sexually acting out with, with other children, and this is very normal behavior. If somebody is hurting you, they're in control of what your body feels but if you're hurting yourself it's in some way how you feel like you've got control and power over what's happening to your own flesh to your own to skin cope with the abuse they will uh, use alcohol or engage in substance abuse to deal with the pain uh, they self-medicate themselves. An adult has been or is being sexually abused are sexual difficulties, loss of interest in sex or compulsive sexual behaviors, turmoil in close relationships, depression, anger, fear, especially when triggered by Some reminders of the abuse. Some children misuse food. They do this by either eating too much 
or not eating enough or sometimes eating too much and then purging and this is again another way that they have some degree of power and control over what's going on in their own lives the misuse of drugs of alcohol and tobacco serves a similar kind of purpose about one's safety neglect of house job children and bank accounts trouble concentrating struggling at school or work feelings of guilt and shame a negative self image sense of dirtiness both inside and out prevalent distrust of others and emotional numbness In 2019, Michael's niece Brandy Jackson reveals how she had a 10-year friendship and relationship with Wade, where they were sexually active at some point. This is important considering Wade claimed Michael groomed him into hating women, but Brandy says it was actually Michael who hooked him up. She also talks about how Wade cheated on her with several women. In fact, he cheated on her with Britney Spears, and before that he also had a short affair with Prince's ex-wife, Maite Garcia. It was said might have visited his 18th birthday, when she herself was 26 at the time. If they were in a relationship before that, which seems to be the case, this could be seen as pedophilia actually. It seems clear Wade did not hate women or was groomed into believing so. In fact, this only confirms Wade was fully capable of having adult sexual relationships and also was aware of what consensual sex was and what abuse or rape was. So Wade and I met in approximately 1991. We had done several things together. We did the LA Gear photo shoot with my Uncle Michael, as well as the black or white video. But after doing those two shoots, he had developed a crush on me and had asked my Uncle Michael if he would basically put us in a situation where we could get to know each other further. So my uncle introduced, or my uncle invited Wade, his mom and his sister, as well as me and my brother to the ranch. So we spent about five to seven days there just getting to know each other. Um, our relationship, you know, got, we got closer in this time frame. And at the end of this trip, he asked me very kindly if I would be his girlfriend. It was just a very sweet thing. At the time, you never saw anything weird happening between Wade and Michael. No. And of course, according to Wade's story, he's still in the midst of being brutally sexually abused at this point. Absolutely. Um, and, <clears throat> and being told to not like women, is my understanding. He was kind of being groomed. Yeah, the women... He, he, he said in the documentary that Michael told him not to trust women. Exactly. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and yet he's seeking... Out you. We were always either on the phone if we weren't together or we were at each other's house. Um, this was a very age appropriate relationship. We weren't having sex at 12 years old, but I did not have sex with Wade until I was just about 18 years old. Um, it was something that was important to me to wait. He supported it. He was okay with that. At the time, I had assumed that this was his first time as well. Um, just because we were in this exclusive relationship and we were very close. Later, I learned that that wasn't the case, that he had just recently started um, sleeping around. So I, I started questioning him some more, specifically at this point with Britney, because his behavior was becoming significantly different with her. Britney Brit Spears. Correct, Britney Spears. When, when this came out in the media with him and Britney, I questioned Wade again. He said, Brandy, I swear to you, this is not true. Then I got a call from our mutual friend, somebody that's very close to me and very close to him. And they told me, Brandy, I have to tell you, Wade is sleeping with Brittany. He's sleeping with this person's wife. He's sleeping with this underage girl. By the way, when you say this person's wife, it's a famous person. If there's a famous person. Very famous person. Absolutely. Wife. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So I immediately called Wade and I confronted him on all of these things. And he just kind of paused and started crying, asking me, how do I know this? How do I, who told me this? How would I, how could I possibly know these things? Now, was that the end of your romantic Absolutely. relationship? 100%. That was the end of our everything. I, was not, I couldn't be friends with him at this point. The story is that Michael told him this is what people who love each other do. So I would imagine, like you, that he would try to, that would carry over into our relationship since we loved each other. You did love him. You, Absolutely. And he loved you. Absolutely. You agree then with my confusion over your experience with him sexually not being compatible with what you would think would be the case given his story about Michael. Absolutely. It doesn't, from, from what I know of Wade and how I've known him to grow up, there was no indication that he had had any type of, I'm going to say sexual encounter of that nature, abuse of that nature. Um, and when he started to change and, and do things that weren't right or to, to have different feelings, I was able to pick up on that immediately. 
you know, to break up Britney Spears and Justin Timberlake at, at, Brit- at the height of Britney's celebrity and sexuality, uh, that takes a lot of confidence. It, he has a lot of confidence for sure. Wade is extremely confident. Uh, and he has always been extremely confident. He's got this self-awareness in almost an egocentric sort of way, um, narcissistic sort of way. There's nothing that he, if he wants something, he's going to go after it and he's going to get it. If he's telling the truth about Michael Jackson having abused him from the age of 7 to 14, let's go through this. At 7 years old, this is how he's learning exactly. what sex is. It doesn't strike me at all, that, based upon your experience with him, that he is dysfunctional in the way that he views sex or the way that he believe, or the evolution of your relationship, the evolution of your relationship sounds perfectly normal and innocent. When you would think, wouldn't you, that if he's learning what sex is from a man at the age of seven, that everything would be off, everything would be distorted, that he would first instance think it was very weird to wait six years exactly. to have sex with his girlfriend when Michael and he had sex right off the bat. Exactly. Do you believe that he was sexually abused by Absolutely. Michael Jackson? Absolutely not. You know, I, I base it, one, on my uncle. I know my uncle very, very mm. well. I know that he would never do the things that Wade is claiming. And two, I know Wade. I know him and I know his behavior. I knew him in the midst of all of this. He, I do know that Wade is a liar and he's a manipulator, but he was not abused. Later, it was revealed Wade was also doing research to write a tell-all book about his relationship with Michael, something his wife didn't approve of. He denied asking a lot of money for it. He visited websites like MJ Facts, which is notoriously anti-Michael Jackson, posting a lot of biased articles. They also post their views and opinions about Wade and Michael. It takes a whole year before Wade goes on TV in May 2013 to tell the world about how Michael abused him from age 7 to age 14. And only then he files a lawsuit against the Michael Jackson estate for millions of dollars. Daily Mail TV can exclusively reveal that personal notes for Michael Jackson accuser Wade Robson show that he was shopping around a tell-all book over five years ago. In it, it would detail his sexual abuse allegations against the King of Pop because he felt it was, quote, Time to get mine. According to court documents exclusively seen by Daily Mail TV, Wade was so desperate to get his story out there that he went to several high-profile publishing companies. In those meetings, Robson was demanding, quote, a large amount of money for the rights to his story. The proposal also nearly destroyed his marriage, with Robson considering a divorce when his wife Amanda advised against writing a memoir about his alleged abuse. All right, so Chris, why did this book then end up not happening? Jesse, publishers ended up passing on the book proposal largely because it was being shopped three years after Jackson's death. That is when Wade filed a $1.5 billion civil lawsuit seeking damages from the Michael Jackson estate. When questioned by Jackson's attorney why the book deal went away, Wade suggested it was his call rather than a lack of interest from publishers. Robson's lawsuit against Jackson was ultimately thrown out of court because it was not filed within four years of Jackson's death as is required in California. Wade's confession and lawsuit come at the same time there's a civil court case going on between Katherine Jackson, Michael's children and AEG. Although Wade's lawyers deny it and AEG denies it, Wade has worked for AEG on several occasions and also has indirect connections to them. This is from Wade's lawyer's website, Helen Yu. She worked for Avalon Attractions and she mentions Golden Voice. Her boss at Avalon at the time, Brian Murphy, became the president of Golden Voice AEG, which is part of AEG and is therefore connected to Randy Phillips. Concepts West is also part of AEG and was founded by Paul Gangoware. Gangoware was the tour manager for two of Michael's world tours in the 90s. Some connections between Wade and AEG seem to have disappeared online. Demi Lovato, promoted by AEG, announced her tour dates in October 2011 and Wade is mentioned as the creative director. There's no indication of him pulling out of that tour. In fact, I can't find anything at all anymore online about Wade being involved in that tour. I did find an old version of Wade's Wikipedia page 
where it still mentions, but there's nothing there on his current page. Same goes for Lafado's Wikipedia page. Only on a Portuguese version was it mentioned that Wade was part of Demi Lovato's tour. And there's a reference on the website of the Pulse on tour where he was working at the same time. This seems strange. Why has it been removed? And Wade's lawyer Helen Yu removed her connection to Avalon Attractions on her website. The first screenshot shows her mentioning Avalon, which is connected to AEG and she mentions Motown. The review on there is from Wade. The second screen shows her leaving out Avalon and Motown and the review is now from producer Keith Harris. What's also interesting is that Yu was working as an intern for Sony in the late 90s and she has known Wade since he was a little kid. It's in February March of 2013 that AEG was hit with a lawsuit by Katherine Jackson. And just two months later Wade files a claim against the estate. It's also pretty disturbing the accusations come after AEG had warned the Jacksons some ugly stuff was going to come out if there was to be a trial. I don't buy it for one second. I don't know who's influencing him one way or the other. I don't know why he's been induced to apparently change his very strong and very powerful testimony of 2005. And remember, he didn't just give testimony in the courtroom. He did some interviews after the trial where he also said, it's ridiculous, nothing happened. He would look at the people interviewing him and ask them if they'd ever slept in a bed with a friend or with a parent. I mean, he could not have been stronger for us. And I don't know who's influenced him. I don't know whether he needs money. I find it very curious that this development happened in the middle of the civil trial that Catherine Jackson and Michael's children have filed against AEG. Uh, it, none of it adds up very well to me. The jury believed him. I believed him. Uh, you know, the guy was strong. He didn't just make one statement that something had never happened. He gave repeated powerful testimony that Michael was his friend, that Michael had never touched him inadvertently or improperly. Well, ultimately, all of these civil cases amount to money. So um, do you think, number one, he's motivated by money? And it sounds to me like you think that maybe uh, some of the people involved in the case are behind this, the civil case. I find it very curious. I find it very curious that this claim has arisen in the middle of Katherine Jackson and Michael Jackson's children's civil trial against AEG. AEG's lawyer got up in his opening statement in that courtroom and said things were going to get ugly, uh, suggesting he's going to try and vilify and uh, take Michael Jackson's reputation and try and pound it and hurt it. And, uh, you know, they all, they're, trying to, they're trying to minimize the value of Michael Jackson's reputation. You sound like you think Conspiracy. AEG has had uh, communications with Wade Robeson uh, even before the case started. I, uh, I've said what I'm going to say about that issue. Many of the boys and girls who came to Neverland felt a strong family-like connection to Michael and saw a father figure in him. Kevin Orfiso, Brett Barnes, Wade, they all call him dad. I loved him like his own father, brother. In 2002, Wade's father, Dennis, commits suicide. Wade later says how he refused to grieve his father's death. He also said how he felt guilty of calling Michael dead and how he excluded his own father from his life after he moved away to Los Angeles with his mother and his sister. I think Wade felt the loss of Michael as losing another father, telling the story of being the kid that danced with Michael Jackson on stage at age 5 had become his identity. Wade felt such a strong bond to Michael, like family, and defending him every chance he got and at the trial in 2005 was a natural thing. He may have expected to be included in the This Is It tour. When he wasn't recognized in his grief after Michael died, I think he felt left out, betrayed and his grief turned into anger and caused his mental breakdown. 
He after all saved Michael Jackson from prison. He after all abandoned his own father for Michael. Not being included for the tribute in 2011, while others were, was probably the final straw. Wade was hurt and wanted to punish the one that abandoned him, and he knew exactly what would have hurt Michael the most. Maybe at one point he realized he had gone too far, but he's in this too deep now. This is his new identity, still connected to Michael and it always will be. Like Michael, he made himself immortal, even if it's based on lies. Why didn't you go to the lawyers and do this quietly? And try to, to settle some, right. make some kind of a deal? Right, because I've lived in silence. That's one thing that you'll never see from me. I'm never going to go away with this for the sake of money. I'm never going to be silenced for money. fundamentally saying that this cancer victim and this entire family are liars yes if you want to attribute a reason or a motive <laughs> I don't think it's hard to find one it's financial I mean all we did was watch you know comedy or cartoons could anything negative happen between the two of us the answer that to my to that question your question is hell no people that's really what they kind of don't get is that it's, you know, he has this bedroom, but at the same time, it's two stories. But yeah, and it wasn't anything like weird. It wasn't anything we thought about it. We go to the movies and we do this, we do that. And it's like, okay, you know, you just you plop down, you go to sleep, you wake up. You know, it's like, it was just kind of just what friends do. I've slept in the same bed as like, you know, a bunch of my friends. It's kind of just what happens, you know? He never did anything out of one. I mean, anything, you know? I mean, the closest he ever came to touching me was like maybe slapping me on the leg one, you know, to talk about that I'd lost weight. Yeah, I grew up with him, and I, when I met him, you know, first thing I remember Feldman says, don't call him Mike, don't call him Mike, and oh, okay, I won't. I said, what's up, Mike? Yeah, he gave me a big hug, and, you know, he just treated me like gold, treated everybody I saw around, the two, three T's, Tito kids were there, and, you know, just treated everybody with such dignity and respect, and just loved everything and everybody. He is absolutely a child, and I viewed him that way. We talked as almost as two kids. It, it wasn't that whole thing, and, and, and quite frankly, no matter how many you know, reports or things or what people say, I will never believe that Michael was any of the things that, that they wanted to report him or, you know, about him. I, 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 don't, I won't believe it, because being a kid, being you know, 12 and 13 and 14, knowing Michael Jackson and uh, hanging out with Michael, uh, that never occurred. It never seemed like it could have occurred. Uh, there was nothing ever questionable. Uh, I simply won't believe it. Ricky Matsura told us from Tokyo he was the then 12-year-old boy who spent four days in the presence of the pop star in 1998. The boy described in a magazine article as having been supplied by one of Jackson's people with three soda cans filled with wine to the point where he became sick. His father, according to the article, was so furious he immediately ended talks with Jackson about a theme park venture. How much, if any of it, is true? Absolutely zero. Besides the fact of Michael Jackson coming to Japan in 98 and actually uh, giving a press conference about this theme park business, all the other allegations and statements made about his trip to Japan in 98 are completely false. Completely false. When he says sharing a bed, everybody's out to make it like he's, you know, going to sexually molest them. And that's absolutely not true. He never had the chance to, to joke around as a kid, you know, play water gun fights and that kind of thing. It was all strictly business pressure on him as a child. And that's what he seeks in children, is that worryless childhood. Matsura says Jackson never said or did anything inappropriate over the four days he spent in his company. He says he did drink a champagne toast under his father's supervision and that he did later become sick. He's coming forward now on his own because he knows that at least one of the stories about Michael Jackson is untrue. I was there, you know, I know everything that happened. Did anybody from Michael Jackson's camp, I'm talking about lawyers, 
public relations people, spokespeople, offer to pay you anything to come forward, or have they paid you anything to come forward? I, I could open my bank account records for everybody. No, no money. No, not at all. Your bedroom is a private place. Yes. My bedroom is a private place. Michael's bedroom was never a private place. It growing was, up, you mean? Growing up. I mean, remember, Michael was, was performing for kings and queens at the age of five. Mm -hmm. He never had a private life, ever. And you can also go even further before that. I mean, him and his brothers were all sharing rooms in a tiny house in Gary, Indiana. Right. It was a two-bedroom home with how many brothers and sisters. Right. So that concept of privacy, my own room, never existed for him. Right. It's a public room, as far as Michael is concerned. So Michael loved to have, in this public room of his, he loved to have sleepovers with kids. He really genuinely loves kids. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there's anything sexual no. going on. I don't know if you've ever met a mother like this. There are some mothers who just, they have a kid even though they're not capable of raising it, mm -hmm. even though they have no way to make a living. And to use an old expression that normally just doesn't apply, 
these are people who think the world owes them a living. They don't really think they should have to work. So imagine you're one of these mothers, mm -hmm. and you've got a little kid, and Michael invites your kid over to a sleepover. Hey, money has just fallen into your lap. Because if you make a sexual accusation against Michael, he's going to have to keep it out of the press. And that's worth money, bigger money than you've ever seen in your life. And once one person does it, it gains credibility. So more people can do it, even, and, even if it has nothing to do with reality whatsoever, and you're taking the kindness of Michael Jackson and turning it against him. Did Michael Jackson ever touch you inappropriately? No, not at all. and Lisa Marie's visit to Budapest, Hungary last year was a dream come true for his fans. But for young Bella Farkas, dying in desperate need of a liver transplant, that visit saved his life. Bella is an energy-filled five-year-old now. Thanks to Jackson's Heal the World Foundation, the full cost of his liver transplant was paid for. Hello, Michael. Hello, Lisa. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Bye. Bye.